And good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to another live Xanadu Gallery online critique group session. Today is Wednesday, February 9th, 2022. It's great to be back here with you in a Wednesday morning session. Um, and just quickly by way of announcement, next Wednesday, um, we will have an Ask Me Anything session. So um, keep an eye out for an email announcing that session. Prepare your questions in the meantime. Um, we'll look forward to taking those questions next week. Um, but with that, I want to jump right into our review of this week's featured artist, uh, Dorian Scotty, who is uh, joining us from Tubac in Arizona, a local uh, or a fellow Arizona. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Dorian. Welcome. Uh, let me get you unmuted there. There we go. Good morning. Good morning to you. Thank you. Yes. It's nice to be here. And, and Dorian, you're in uh, Tubac, um, yeah. which um, it's, it's uh, largely an artist community. I mean, it is a uh, creative little town, lots of good little galleries. It's south of Tucson. Tell us a little bit about Tubac for those of us here who haven't had the chance to visit. It's a small village. Uh, it is very tourist friendly, although the sidewalks are terrible for walking on. Uh, we really don't have any sidewalks. So, you know, you're in a small southwestern town when you come there. Um, there are people here who are snowbirds and people here who have retired here. Um, there are There is a population of people who grew up here and in the area. Um, as you said, there are some galleries in town and some decent restaurants and a couple of places nearby to stay. Right now, the uh, starting today is the annual Festival of the Arts, which goes until Sunday, I believe. Uh, you'd have to check that, but that's yeah. a big thing where a lot of artists come from out of town and several years back there was a lot of gritching by local people about all of these artists coming from other places and setting up their tents and taking over our little village <laughs> we have literally two main roads and then a couple of side connecting roads and so what they did is they, they moved they have an open studio for local artists every year that stretches from up to green valley which is between us and tucson if you look on the map and down to nogales and they added that, they put, they scheduled that this year at the same time. So people who come here- if they Counterbalance get, a little bit. Yeah, if they get sick of walking around, they can drive out to different artist studios and go and see people actually working in their studios. Although I don't, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't think I'd want somebody coming in here while yeah. I was working, it's not really <laughs> safe, but- uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it has been a few years since I've been to Tubac, but it's a charming little town. Um, you, few you know, years, uh, you don't live that far away. Yeah, I know I'm close, and and that's probably my my uh, excuse, right? Is that it's so close that I never make the effort to uh, to make the trip, but it is definitely worth it. And those of you who are joining us, if you ever have the chance to visit Southern Arizona, Tubac and Bisbee and and uh, those areas down in in Southern Arizona are beautiful and and, and, and a lot of character and flavor. Um, Dorian. Give us a little bit of an introduction and background where you're from originally and how you came to, um, to have an interest and in, in be creating art. Okay, um, well, I was born in New York City, but I grew up in the artist community of Silvermine, Connecticut, which straddles three towns. Um, I pretty much grew up there. I, I always drew and started painting with tempera when I was in my teen years, but I always wanted to be a soldier. I grew up wanting to be a soldier. And so as soon as I was old enough, there I was in the recruiting office and I went into the army. Uh, after my initial enlistment, I decided that it probably would be smart if I wanted to do something to take me to retirement, to do something that I'd actually survive to yeah. retirement. Uh, so I got out and went to college. I started as a fine arts major and then switched to graphic design and began a 40-year career as a, an illustrator and graphic designer, working mostly in the nonprofit sector, Habitat for <laughs> Humanity, Mystic Aquarium, Sea Research Foundation, places like that. Uh, it's taken me around a lot of the country, um, and I've done everything from packaging and uh, medical testing equipment panels to the graphics on submarines. Um, I did the graphics for Bob Ballard's Deep Sea Submersible. If you've ever seen mm. his, the movie about Titanic, that's, that's him. 
um, but mostly publication work, uh, a lot of newspapers and uh, magazines and books. Um, so I've always painted. It's always been my second, you know, um, ask anybody that's lived with me, they'll tell you that, you know, that I've spent more time paying attention to canvas than them. Um, yeah. Except for my current girlfriend. Uh, and in 2004, um, I went back to school. I went back to Silvermine and went to the Artist Guild School there for a year. So in 2005, with the urging of a couple of my instructors there, Jason, I moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is a huge, you know, there's hundreds of galleries there, um, artists all over the that city and I've always liked it. I traveled to there several times in my life and I always felt a pull to that, to the Southwest. And I like, you know, I fell in for the romance of Santa Fe. It's got a very romantic image, you know, three cultures and all these old yeah. buildings and churches and the cathedral is there. Um, and so I was there um, for a year doing research, building up my inventory and making a good portfolio to take around. I read your book and followed your advice. Um, and got myself the ring binder with the sleeves and went around and uh, after that was after I was there for a year and got into a gallery. Um, it was funny because I didn't go into her gallery with a portfolio. She saw my work online somehow and sold a painting of mine to one of her collectors uh, before she and I had even talked. And so wow. she sold one of my paintings from online and um, you know, went and then met her and she's a nice lady. And she said, well, um, she had mostly abstract art, which you'll find a lot of in Santa Fe, not representational art, but abstract art and contemporary art. She took a chance and had, um, had me do a show there. So I put together a show and then she started to represent me. We did pretty well for a while. Another gentleman approached me who had a, a gallery, and I do figurative painting um, as well as other kinds of representational work. He was interested in figurative painting. So I had two galleries. You know, a lot of galleries don't like that when you do that. But the city's large enough, and what I was producing was different enough so that they didn't mind me being mm -hmm. two galleries, which is, I think, unusual. You tell me. Yes, you yeah. Know, um, you probably have an area where you say, well, if you want to go in another gallery, it's got to be outside of Arizona or something like that. Um, when the economy went bad, that gentleman disappeared in the middle of the night, along with mm. a dozen of my paintings and several other artists that he repped. He was just gone. Oh, no. And, yeah, the first gallery I went in, she started to uh, circle her wagons and concentrate more on the people that were her main collectors, which collected contemporary art. So I kept getting moved back further and further in her gallery. And finally, it was, you know, she wasn't selling anything. And um, ultimately, after a year of abject poverty, I became homeless. Wow. And went, went back into graphic design and went to work for a university for two years and then um, came to Arizona. And um, I've been here for nine years, I think. Um, worked at a retirement community as their graphic designer, doing everything there and painting also. And I've just begun to transition to going back to full-time painting. Um, the, I just rebuilt this studio. Um, <laughs> so don't mind the cuts on my hands and the sheet rock yeah. compound on my vest. I just finished this just wow. like days ago. So um, just getting back into it and um, a slight switch of the, uh, or transition of the things that um, I want to paint about. Um, the pandemic and my own evolution as a person and an artist is getting more, moving me more towards um, what is common amongst all of us. Hmm. Uh, if you talk to physicists, then I'm, I'm interested in physics. So I pay attention to Greg Braden and those guys. Um, they'll talk about the particle that makes up everything in the universe and how it's common amongst all of us. And I won't go off in a soapbox. My girlfriend will kill me if I start talking about this again, because I've subjected her to hours of conversation about it. And she's interested in it, but I, these guys yeah. get a little long-winded and I'll try to avoid that. But that's the thing I want to pursue in my art. I believe that when you look at a painting, 
you walk into a museum or you walk into a gallery and you look at a painting and there's a painting, you walk over to something about it touches you, right? It, it moves you. Um, I think that what that is in part is it's emotion, it's making you think or the colors attract you or something, but it touches something inside you. And I think in part, if an artist is able to channel what is common amongst all of us, get in the flow, um, that leads them to create artwork. Maybe they're a channel, it's affected a little bit. And I, when I do a painting that comes out well, I say, I didn't do it, God did it. I just held the brush. Yeah. Um, and you've heard that from other artists and we a lot of people will just say, I don't know how I did that. I, you know, I just, I, I just started painting and it happened and I walked away. I came back and I was like, who the who hell did that? Did it? I didn't do that. <laughs> That's not, I can't paint that good. You know, I just, I'm, I'm not that talented or whatever. Right? Um, well, I think, um, that, that, that is a great segue Dorian into taking a look at some of the pieces that you had submitted to us. And maybe we'll have an opportunity to kind of talk about the new direction as well as we, as we do that. Um, but let's, let's pull up the first image. Um, and we've got several figurative pieces here. Um, and so talk to us a little bit, um, about maybe how your um, approach and interest in subject matter has evolved over the years it's, that's kind of led to this work and, and also, um, you know, where, where your style is coming from, what your inspiration is. Uh, that's interesting that you say that. I've looked at lots of artists. I mean, I, I used to spend a lot of time drawing in the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. So you know how diverse their collection is. Um, a, lot of, a lot of artists have... In, you know, inspired me, masters, Rembrandt, um, you know, people like that. Um, I'm not gonna run through a lot of names, contemporary artists as well. Um, this one, but, uh, the, the one we're looking at now, a little bit of uh, Caravaggio maybe springs to mind with some of the and, 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 and the and color. Yeah, he's one of my favorite painters. I, I love his work and uh, I've tried to avoid in my own life going the direction he went in his life. Um, uh, but his work, I mean, and when you read about him and how, you know, he would sit down and he'd do a painting in four hours and, you know, then he'd have to leave that town because of some altercation or something. And, uh, you look at the murder the, here and there, uh, minor details. <laughs> yeah. But you look at the work and the work is, you know, how did he do this in four hours, especially at that time? Now I have, you know, any pigment I want, I can go to the art store and I can buy the best brushes that made in the world, rosemary brushes, check out brushes, you name it, you know, good conditions. You know, I can control my light. And think about what this guy was conditions he was painting with and the equipment he had to work with, you know. Again, another, these are, I love light. I love the effect of light on skin. I love painting skin. Um, I do like attractive women but that isn't the only thing. And a uh, funny story from art school about that, but I won't get into it. Um, nobody wants to paint Christy Brinkley when you're in art school. You want that old lady with a lot of curves and wrinkles in her face. And um, it, it's, it's interesting. I, art, flesh is difficult to paint as any of these folks that are with us who paint people or portraits know. Um, so that's been an interesting challenge. And, and I like the effect of light and dark, chiaroscuro um depicting different kinds of things there's a little metal in the earring i like that but mostly it's about light um you know that's a, a big part of it and what um it, did your interest in the figure begin in school before school how is it has it endured what what, what draws you to the human figure it's lifelong. It doesn't. It it's, hasn't been static. I mean, it, it it continues to grow and go in different directions. Um, that's yeah. I, it's always been there. Uh, you know, I I drew all kinds of things when I was a, a child. A lot of things that I would draw and paint. Aside from the psychedelic period, where Peter Max effect, you know, had an influence on the stuff I was doing, and our recreational substances, let's say. Um, a lot of nature, I did a, you know, a lot of drawing. Um, Silvermine is a beautiful area. My dad's, my family's property had a river running through it. So we had property on both sides of the river and a Nile in the middle. There was a, a lot of wildlife there, you know, otters, um, 
aigrettes and heron and all kinds of things uh, migrating through the area. Um, but I was I did feel gravitated towards you know towards people uh, and the connection we feel with people. You know, somebody looking at you, you looking at somebody, and uh, trying to figure out what is their story, what's going on here. Um, that's what I really like. I like to look at a painter and say, try to figure out what, what's, what's happening with this woman. She's looking at me, she has a funny look you know, on her face. Is, it, is she, is something happening? Is she happy? Is she sad? Um, and this was funny, pearl ear, woman with a pearl earring. It's yeah. like, everybody was painting a copy of Vermeer's painting. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna do my own pearl earring. Um, and so that's what this is. And instead of girl with a pearl earring, it's woman with a pearl earring. Uh, explored a little bit with color in the background. Uh, I apologize, this photograph is not real great. Some of the backgrounds kind of modeled in the upper left-hand corner. But it was an exploration of, of color um, and reflected in the skin um, also. And then let's look at um, the format of presentation. What we're seeing here, um, the, the, uh, the, the girl on the chest, mm. um, this is a, a fairly contemporary presentation, an unframed box canvas with color side. Would this be fairly typical of how you're approaching the presentation of your work? Yes and no. Um, I love really nice uh, framework. And if I do a stand, this is one of the gallery wrap or uh, museum wrap thick two inch thick, um, heavy, it's large. And I like to have, uh, I hate bad frames. I've gotten frames, um, pre-framed canvas. And after it's up for a while, you look at it, and, you know, it bows a little bit. That drives me crazy. And if you have a, a good frame, you can hide that, uh, sure. provided it doesn't bow too much. Um, for these, I do do it this way. And I paint around the edge. Um, you can see a little bit of the white that I, I've got to go back around that uh, and repaint the edge of that. If it's smaller, I like to put a frame on it. Um, the only problem with that, Jason, is when I took paintings to a gallery and I had them framed, I said, well, don't spend any money on frames because someone's going to come and they're going to look at the painting and they're going to say, well, I hate that frame. Right. They're going to want to buy their own the frame. The vein of the frame framed art. The artwork yeah. goes with my house or with the other paintings I have in, in my library. But this frame, what were you thinking about? You know, this yeah. looks like, you know. So it's, and it's so subjective and there's millions and millions of frames out there. Um, and I love this one, one site where they sell prints and you can look at your artwork in different frames. Contemporary, classic gold, you know, gold frame carved. Uh, and then put it on a wall. They have like four or five living room walls and you can put it up there and see what it looks like. I, so something like this, I would try to leave like that. It's yeah. just too much to build a frame around that unless I go to a framer. Um, but the smaller pictures, when I do a smaller painting, um, I usually use contemporary plain, contemporary black frames. I'll show you. Um, this is, um, like this. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. This, this is uh, just. Let me of, hold on. Let me pull it up so we can see it a little bit larger. Okay. So this is uh, Dia de los Muertos. I painted this after going to that day here in Tubac. We celebrate it every year. And I wanted to do something just, you know, reminiscent of that. And so I did that. But this is, this is the kind of frame that I would use a contemporary black frame for this, is, you know. Uh huh contemporary piece. Yeah, so uh, I think that um, leads us to a good point to bring in um, some members of the critique group and get some commentary on your work and reaction. Um, and I actually have my, the first comment I have queued up here is uh, Gordon Gray, but Gordon, it looks like I've got you in the session. So maybe instead of reading your comment, I'd love just to have you come in and um, give your impressions of Dorian's work and your reaction to it. Okay, um, can I answer one question? Oh, sure. Annie asked about my name on the painting. I always just use a D and that's sort of an anti-ego thing that I paint on the painting. It's like everybody wants to put their, you know, when I was in art school, I worked with a couple of people who did these, their name very large on the paintings. And it's like, are you selling your name or are you selling the painting? 
Um, this is done, I'm a graphic designer, I do a lot of work digitally. Uh, my work's been online and all kinds of you know, websites and things like that. I wanted you and to so able... that uh, Scotty that we're seeing is added after in the digital. This is not how the yeah. painting would appear. Yeah, I added it afterwards. And I do that so that wherever it appears online, because I can't control that, people know whose artwork it is. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Good. I okay, mean, Gordon, can... let's see if I can get you in and get your, ask you to unmute. There we go. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, thanks. I... Um, anyway, uh, you know, the work is superbly done. There's, there's, no, you know, I think everybody agrees with that. It's beautifully painted. Uh, okay. The, uh, you know, I'll tell you one uh, experience I had with drawing. When I took drawing, we had in this one class, a couple of week session of doing fashion drawing, and which I hated, <laughs> you know, elongated the <laughs> figure to let. And, um, but I, what I learned from that was that the drawing can be more powerful than, let's say, a photograph. Like if you had a trench coat, uh, design. If you had a photograph, you say, "Well, that person looks really nice in, in in that trench coat." But if it was a drawing, you would tend to say, "Well, gee, I, I kind of like the trench coat idea. I might add that to my wardrobe." And uh, so, what I learned from that was that the drawing was it operated very conceptually. And so, when you look at and that, I think that's the power. Uh, and I think Scotty was talk, talking about that that you know these paintings bring a special. There's something different about a painting uh, that can be very powerful like that. The um, when I looked at the paintings, I, the ones that really uh, hit me uh, the most were the first two, which were the nudes, because they're neoclassic. And, you know, so the idea that we go with that is like, you know, the ideal female figure, for instance, or something. And whereas the, the last three, uh, again, superbly executed, but they were more for functionary uh, portraits or landscape. And uh, so... I just come at this with my own experience, <laughs> take it for what it's worth. And I, you know, and I'm not sure what the motivation is behind uh, these paintings. You know, that's, that's a terrific painting, the one on the trunk. Um, what I thought from, from my perspective was, I wonder if the background could be more uh, active uh, piece of, of the work. It, you know, I, it's hard to see, you can, from a technical standpoint, you can't really prove it, um, uh, but maybe, uh, Conceptually, you could add something to it. Like, for instance, the Vermeer one with the pearl earring. Um, when you look at that thing, it's part of the the the, uh, the draw to that painting historically is the background as well. She's sitting in this, you know, that's when the merchant class and uh, Holland was was on the uprise and it was changing patronage and all that. And so they were so in addition, they were showing off all of the material possessions in this totally polished, you know, table and all that. So yeah. you were really brought into the environment of this woman as well. And- Isn't it, isn't um, it interesting too, that a lot of what we know about some certain periods um, of European history is drawn primarily from paintings. You know, yep. how people lived and how, how they furnished their homes and the clothing. And yeah, that's that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, that's that's- that's pretty much all I, I would bring to bring to it as far as my commentary. And again, I'm not sure what what the motive was here. You know, when when I look at the last three, the focus for me is on the talent that went into it, which you which you have, you know, uh, so much talent. But I'm you know, uh, and this is great. It like takes me back into that particular landscape. Um, and if you like landscape and landscape is, you know, this is the one that kind of stands out because it's a landscape and the other ones are figurative. Uh, so, you know, you can take landscape for what it is and, and you know, it transports you back into this, this great place. But the figurative stuff is, is a very powerful, uh, you know, you have a, an element there that can really be developed. And, um, you know, that, that, and, and I'm sort of drawing on my personal experience because I've started, to, I, I'm an abstract painter and I went to a school where um, everything was post duty, was post modern and conceptual. So nobody, nobody had a painting, painting was passe. And uh, can I ask you a question back, about that? I'm sorry. Can I ask you a question about uh, that? Sure. Were you abstracting something or were you just putting colors and shapes and forms on the paper? And when you did an abstract painting, were you thinking about? 
um, a chair in a room with, you know, a bowl on a table or were you just painting shapes? No, I would purely uh, form and shape. And, uh, you know, the, uh, Kandinsky was, was the founder of this pure abstraction. Uh, okay. And I'm not crazy about Kandinsky, but he did a couple of real masterpieces yeah. along that line. Yeah. And, uh, and my motivation actually came more from music uh, and formalized music, which I think is the head of uh, painting at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the, all the musicians love Rothko, you know, <laughs> because he's doing what they, they're visualizing. My musician friend yeah. uh, who brought me into Cal Arts as I went to school was talking about sound clouds and developing these sound clouds and the notation was different and everything else. Yeah. And so just think, you know, it's a very difficult thing I think to think in just pure abstraction. And um, I was trying to combine the two together. I don't want to get too much off of my work, but I was yeah. combining the two oh, together. It, it, uh, well, but no. I think, and, and so th this was kind of an interesting um, um, conversation in the sense that um, we see these, the, you, we, I think we live in a very interesting period of art history where you, I, I suppose this would be true of any period where you have a culmination of all these different influences coming together and reactions and, and um, new work being created. And, and what's interesting to me, and I, I love um, uh, contemporary and abstracted work and I love representational work. And I, I think that, um, that, that it, it is not a, uh, contradiction to, to love both. But what's been interesting to me over, you know, over the years is to see how um, a, a classical style can suddenly start to feel contemporary again. And I almost think that <clears throat> when you look at um, pieces like these, um, where we're drawing from a lot of tradition um, and, and kind of an academic approach to the work, um, that suddenly starts to feel very contemporary again. And so it's kind of interesting to see how the world turns, the art world turns. Um, let, let me pull some more of you in with reactions and commentary to, to Dorian's work. Um, what were your impressions as you saw the work? How did you respond to it? Um, and if you want to throw a hand up in front of the camera or click on the hand icon, I want to get a few more of you in and commenting on the work. Jim, let me go to you. Sapelsa and should be asking you to unmute. Good morning, Jim. Well, good morning. Um, it's, a, it's a great presentation. Uh, I was so glad to hear that that uh, signature or the, the your your name at the bottom was uh, a, uh, just a, like a watermark, so to speak. But uh, it, but otherwise, I thought, wow, that guy is an incredible lettering man. But uh, the uh, I was glad to hear that that's not part of the painting. Uh, I just see. Um, several different styles. And I was just wondering, is there a preference when you, in other words, uh, the, uh, the woman on the chest, your journey, kind of has a Rockwell feeling to me, uh, you know, a, a real illustrator, kind of the, the detail in the chest, her, her uh, position, you know, I mean, she's really saying a lot with gestures, kind of like Norman Rockwell used to do to me. The other ones have the Caravaggio thing is sometimes even uh, I see Salvador Dali, even the, that, that type of realism, that beautiful technique you have. But you have several techniques when you're approaching the figure. Is there one that you prefer or you just go with the personality of the model or. Uh, and then there's another one, the girl with the, the pearl earring uh, kind of has what I would say, kind of a Southwest feel to it, the uh, Santa Fe. I can't think of this. It's, but they, you do have several kind of different styles going on to me. And then what dictates that to you? Uh, do you... I, it totally unconscious and dictated by the subject matter and how I feel about what I'm trying to say with the piece at the time. Um, I think if you were to isolate just the faces or just the skin part of it maybe, or the, the, the body part of it, and look at the technique, I think you'd see more of a similarity. Um, the, the pearl earring paintings up right now, and you could see the color reflected like underneath in her neck where I saw the, the color from uh, the sky in the background reflected in there. There's a little bit more of that. I wanted to push that a little bit more in this particular painting, um, but, the technique and how I work through a painting going from light to dark, uh, I mean, from dark to light, excuse me, um, and then building up the layers is always the same. Um, my palette is 
pretty much the same. I like to experiment with different colors when I read about, um, you know, David LaFell used this for this painting or somebody else. I learned, okay, so how did he use that? And why did he use that color? It might vary a little bit in that. My, I have, I will tell you this in terms of style, one thing I really appreciate is um, more painterly painters. Um, I love the Impressionists. I love a lot of the painters uh, around contemporary painters who paint in a very loose style. And this has been such a battle for me. I step up to a canvas and I want to paint what I see and I want to accentuate the emotion of what I see going on, sadness, happiness, the idea of going on a journey in this particular painting, you know, and what it make you ask, what is that, what's going on with this subject? Um, but I, I keep pushing myself and I didn't send any of the paintings that I did more um, a looser style with to Jason because after reading his book, I was afraid to do that. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and I wanted to keep them kind of the same. And um, it's interesting that you picked up on a difference in technique or, or look. Um, because there is a little bit of a difference in that. And one of the things I was thinking about, and we're looking at the journey right now, I wanted to keep, the trunk was so, um, I don't know, I got so OCD about, you know, I wanted the light to be right and the metal to look like metal. And there was this stainless steel and then the brass, you know, and, and I kind of got carried away with that part of it. And so when I came into the rest of it, I felt like I wanted to loosen it up, but I needed to keep her face which to me, the eyes and the face are the thing that you focus on. I wanted to keep that the center of attention and then have you look at the trunk and go, wow, that really does look like a trunk, you know? And so that affects the technique and probably the look of it ultimately. This one really, really tells such a, a, a like a big story. There's a big story here. I, I really love this, uh, yeah, and, everything and, about it. Yeah. And the other gentleman said something about backgrounds and it was interesting that you said that because when I was studying art and they talked about you know what is the most uh, important art the top of the tier was history painting which you know and then they show you this these landscapes from um, a British artists and it's like you know you, you're like blown away there's these little tiny people and the houses and the, mm -hmm. the sky and all this stuff but it was part of history painting and I like the idea of that. And I think when we look at Vermeer and we look at all of the stuff that's going on, like the artist studio, you know, the one the artist studio, you see his, his back and you see the model and the, the draperies coming down and there's a glow, a map on the wall. And it tells us a lot about what was going on in the world. And there's a whole lot, I mean, a, you know, you could probably write a master's thesis or a doctoral thesis on that painting alone. Um, I don't, I like the idea of that. Um, there's always this, when you're studying with different teachers, they say, well, simplify, you know, take all, you have all of these things going on, especially in like in a landscape. I painted out back here and there's, you know, all these little bushes and then the mountains are there and the sky and mesquite trees and it's all this stuff going on. And, you look at it and if you get too much in there, it overwhelms you and you don't know what to look at. And it looks like a jumble. Uh, think of Hieronymus Bosch. You know, he was telling so many stories and that, but what do you look at? When you look at the painting, it's like all this awful stuff and you're like, you know, overwhelmed by it. And so the idea of keeping things simple. So rather than putting all of the furniture or all of the things in the background, like in this painting, orange wrap that's up now, it's, I want you to look at that body and think about what is that person doing? We're, this is an intimate moment for a person with it's a towel or a piece of clothing and walking away from us in the dark, the shadows being cast on the wall. You're not really sure how deep that space goes beyond her, but you know there's a wall there because of the shadow. To think about that, and that was kind of the focus. And so I do like the idea of, putting more things in there and thank you for that thought. I, that yeah. is something to definitely consider and an area that, you know, I hadn't really thought about that way. So thank you for that. But for these, yeah. some of these, I want to keep it focused on just on the subject and keep it simple, not overwhelm your best. It's yeah, let me pull um, Bill in. Uh, Bill, you've got a comment. Uh, let's see if we can get you. There we go. This is, well, first, let me say, Jason, I 
wanted to respond uh, and was did not write back, uh, which I prefer to do because I like I know you like to have some information that we what we think. I didn't know how to respond initially, Dorian, to to your work. I looked at your website and saw all of the different type of work you have and and realized that it's very much uh, coming from your background. That's very illustrative. What I what I what I would when I look at this, I think about very differently. All of these could be in an ad. <laughs> all of your paintings, all of your paintings could be set up to be in an ad. I would love, for example, your first painting of the woman who's walking away with the. What if she? What if it was not a she, but a him? And what if he was big and fat and old? but still in your wonderful classical style with very smooth skin, not like Lucian Freud, although I really like Lucian Freud. And I would love to see you doing a Lucian Freud, but, <laughs> but, I, but I, I, I would be interested in seeing other types of models than young skinny women. Uh, yeah, and Dorian, you, you alluded to that a little bit um, in, in your comment, um, but, but what's your response to, to Bill's comment? It's fun to hear you say that. When I was in school, 2004 to 2005, I befriended, you know, you get a group of people, there were three of us that were very friendly. And we had this model who, um, she had um, a degenerative deformity where she was, she had, I guess in the old days, not politically correct to say a hunchback, but that's what she had. Very nice lady and a great model. She knew how to hold poses and get into different poses. And one of the, the guys that I was friendly with and used to paint next to said, isn't this, isn't she great? I was like, you know, when I came here, I like wanted to paint pretty girls' faces, you know, these supermodels and whatever. It's like, I don't ever want to do that ever again. These people with wrinkles and deformities and that are different than everybody else, maybe not the same as everyone else or outside of that sphere, are more interesting to paint. And I do enjoy it. Um, and I have done that. I don't display it only because just, I was trying to keep this sort of to, together. I didn't want to just have all figures, which is why I put the Taos Pueblo in there. Um, but but I, I think it's kind of interesting, Dorian. And, and in these sessions, we've not had, uh, we've had a couple of our artists who focus on the figure. And I, I think it's, um, it, it's interesting for me to have this conversation here. You talk about your work and, and, um, you know, again, if, if you kind of, even if you visited my gallery, you don't see, you just see a few figures, but I, I, I just think that um, as people are, are looking at artwork, there's, you have a different kind of experience when you're looking at a figure than you do a landscape or an abstract work. There's a different response and a different interest um, that comes up. And um, I, I I, I love this this concept of looking at the body and the human figure in different ways, and that's what I felt. My reaction as I was looking at your work is, yes, I did see some some variety in terms of your approach and your style through these different pieces. But to me, that was kind of what drew me through the work was was looking at the the figures in different ways and seeing different details and from different perspectives. Um, and I think there's a great opportunity um, for a figurative artist to, to be able to do that, to not do the same, same thing over and over again. Um, uh, a question from Annie, um, one of the classical questions, right? In, in, in a figurative painting, how long does a, a typical painting take? I love um, and do you photograph the model or are you working primarily from, from live models? And my father always answered that question, how long did it take by saying, it took me my whole life. I right. think that's the right answer for, for any of these paintings, but how would you respond to that question? Well, the same way, I love that. Um, and um, I think you put that in your book, actually, um, yeah. about your dad. Um, it, you know, 80,000 hours and then four more to do this particular yes. painting. <laughs> but I understand what she's asking. Um, typically, uh, this painting is um, 40 inches high by 30 inches wide. So that's a fair amount of canvas to cover. And uh, I have, do try to use larger brushes, especially in the background. But uh, when you get into the figure part of it, there's a lot of things that require finer brushes, which, and those things take more time. 
um, a painting like this, I, I would say to answer her question, to give her the answer that she wants, I'd say maybe uh, eight to 12 hours. Hmm. Um, and it, it depends because, you know, I'll look at these paintings and sometimes I'll go back to them, you know, six months later and say, you know, there's something about like this and in the well, the corner of her eye, I don't like the way that curve is. I mean, that's what I saw. Um, and actually it's part of the white of the eye sort of disappears into the lower lid, which happens in people when you look at them. Um, but maybe that's distracting. Maybe it looks like, a, you know, that I don't want to see that. I don't want to focus on that or call attention to that in particular and we'll change it. But probably eight to 12 hours is just the short answer she's looking for. And are you working from live models typically? Um, it's a, a combination of the two. Um, you know, it, it's like the internet. What's good about it is bad about it. When you work from a live model, you're seeing something right in front of you. All the colors, you know, how how is the skin? I mean, you look at your skin and it's layers, right? So if I look at the veins in my hand and I look at it long enough, I see the blue down there, but it's covered over by layers of pink and red and everything else. So that is one of the things that's good about working from a live model, plus perspective and what happens with photos that get flattened out. But a model can't hold the pose forever. So imagine asking a model to sit in one pose for 12 hours and look at you like you're crazy. Yeah. Even, with, even if it was a 20 minute spells with a five minute break in between, it, that would be tough to do. Um, typically, if even if you're working with a live model like this, I, I would paint the trunk, you know, look at the model, start a sketch, take photos, tape the floor where the model's feet are and where, where the raincoat goes as much as I can. Um, and then paint the things that I can paint without the model there. Bring the model back. Okay, what shadows on that trunk did I miss? How did the color in her leg affect the top of the, of the trunk or where do you see it in the metal? And then go in and follow up with those details. So both, a lot of the work takes place with photos because it's a reference that doesn't move um, yeah. And you don't have to pay a model to sit there, you know, for four hours while you're painting. Um, um, In so a lot of ways, what you're describing is a, a production process. Um, you're the director and the producer and, and the painter. Yeah. And, uh, and in my own defense, I have produced a lot of ads. <laughs> yeah. I was a commercial artist for 40 years and I designed <laughs> magazines and worked with uh, fashion photographers and food photographers, depending on uh, what the special issue was. Like um, I started out in a small paper in Northern Vermont. It was the Alternative News and Arts Weekly. And, you know, we do special issues like a Christmas time and a fashion issue. So has that washed through my life? I guess it has. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I look at things kind of maybe with a little different eye than some of you folks who just have the advantage of just working from life all the time and not being subjected to the rigors of commercial art. Yeah. It's like well, somehow or... we've managed to have a, uh, a little bit of a different kind of discussion today, which I love. Um, you know, it's fun. These sessions, I don't think we have to stick to any kind of format. Today, we got to talk a little bit more history. Um, we are quickly running. We've, we've run out of time. But Gay, I'm going to let you in. And actually, I see Gay and Terry. I'm going to let the two of you have the last, co last comments. Gay, let me go to you and then to Terry, and then we'll wrap up. Oh, hold on, Gay. I, let me get you unmuted there. Unmute. There we are. There we go. Your work is excellent. Um, personally, for me, the last three are very interesting. The girl with the pearl ear, per pearl earring, is probably to me the one which pulls me in personally. I want to know her because I feel she's a breathing entity that I could get to know. Um, and so uh, that's, and she's a little untidier than the others. I like that. Um, the, the building itself pulls me into those spaces. I wonder, I begin to wonder a little bit. And then the last one was the last one, the uh, trunk going on a journey. Mm -hmm. I just want to know where she's going um, and what propelled her to be sitting there, there. What is she waiting for? Um, and so I felt more personally attracted and the other two are excellent, excellent. Okay. But I felt remote. I felt uh, less engaged with those particular people. Um, but none of that's a reflection of your abilities or your structures or your composition 
or you're technically uh, painting or your choices. It's just, I found myself warming to the last three. That was all, but it's all yeah. very good. Thank Excellent. You. Thanks, Gay and Terry. Sorry. I was just going to make a comment about your work being so excellent, but also about titles. Um, even the Adobe piece, um, Taos Pueblo, I think some of your titles draw us in, uh, in a different way than your other titles. And I was looking through your website and I think I'm always talking about titles because I can see things that aren't there with the right title. So even though you might not have a figure in this painting, a title like Where Has She Gone or They Were Here or what, you know, whatever. Then I begin to see a link between this piece and your other pieces. Um, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Excellent. All, all great comments. And, and again, we are out of time, so we'll have to wrap up. But um, thank you, uh, Dorian, so much for sharing your work with us and, and um, uh, giving us some background and talking about the inspiration and the technique. Um, it, it is so much fun to get to see your work. and We appreciate you giving, the, the, giving us the opportunity to share in it. Thank you, Jason. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. And again, we'll be back here uh, next Wednesday morning for an Ask Me Anything session where we can continue this conversation or have any conversation.